Well, all right. Well, I guess we'll get started. Uh, some people might be slow moving tonight. I know we just jumped to a new time, so maybe they're get, still getting adjusted. But obviously, welcome in, everybody, to part nine. Three levels. Really excited to get back to hearing people's journeys. Last week, we kind of went a little different direction, tried to mock interviews. And uh, so excited to get back to hearing people's journeys. And uh, so we'll get to it. But uh, we got three really good ones tonight. Um, I'm excited to hear one. I, I, I don't really know at all. I'm excited to get to hear him. And then two, I've gotten to know um, on some aspect over the years. So really excited to, uh, to get to hear them. So obviously just a couple of the rules for anybody that doesn't know, just we'll, uh, we'll let them share and then we'll open up for questions. If you have a question, obviously just introduce yourself, uh, name and what school you're at, and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So First up tonight, we've got Coach Ross Hodge uh, from University of North Texas, uh, associate head coach. Um, and uh, I want to thank Jareen Dowling for introducing me to Ross and encouraging me to get him on. So, um, you know, obviously, if Reem's so passionate as he is about anything, uh, about getting Ross on, I know it's going to be good. So without further ado, we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to Ross. Hey, Dave, appreciate you having me man um you know excited to be on this you know type of platform and i've watched so many of these man um you know and that's what's unique about this time period is you do have a chance to maybe slow down from our normal routines and you know just a wide array array of speakers and topics i mean i've seen high school coaches d3 coaches WNBA coaches um you know and just it's a great opportunity to learn and so as i share my journey and some thoughts on uh some things i feel like are important it's certainly not like a like i have all the answers man i mean this is going in this will be my 18th year in college coaching and i told uh coach mac grant mccaslin our head coach you know, I feel like at times I know less now than I ever, ever did, you know, and uh, there's just so many ways to do things, so many um, different avenues to take um, with the game itself. So I'm excited, you know, if you guys have questions, even, even as I'm kind of going through uh, my path and who I've worked for, if you have questions about those, certainly feel free. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about just a couple of topics. Um, nothing, nothing crazy. We can, we can open it up. So, um, that was one thing I was, I was a junior college coach for five years at three at Paris, um, and two at Midland. And then, uh, my first coaching job was Southern Miss assistant coaching job at this level. And one of the things I was most excited about when I made that transition was being able to go watch people that I really respected practice, um, Mark Adams was at Howard, who is pretty much the de facto defensive coordinator at Texas Tech now. Johnny Estelle was at Navarro, Steve Green, so just so many. Um, but being able to go and watch that, as a JUCO coach, you don't always get to do that. But So I was really excited about that, just to be able to learn and and kind of kind of um, watch people, you know, and see what makes people great in different ways. But, uh, but I'll get going a little bit. Before I do, man, I'll tell you this. I have an eight-year-old son. And like most people, you know, we were we were shut in pretty good because of the COVID stuff. But he just started practicing back baseball uh, last week, and just getting back out there after like two months of not doing it. As soon as I got home, I text Matt and Jareem, our other two assistants, and I said, "Man, when we when we get a chance to get back out on the floor with our teams, it is going to be a hell of a day, man. Because just even being out there with little eight year olds running around." It was uh, it was fun. So, um, but yeah, I'm from I'm from this area. Grew up right outside of uh, Dallas. Went to Seagaville High School. Played for a phenomenal coach, Leonard Bishop, was his name. Um, great man. Really believed in me as a young guy, as a young player, and uh, helped show me a way. Um, wasn't wasn't great by any stretch of the imagination, but was a good player. But um, Coach Bishop was a great coach. He, he coached, and we were good at Seagaville High School. A couple years later, that's where LaMarcus Aldridge played at Seagaville. He was probably four or five years after me. But when I left and went to uh, Paris Junior College, I played there. And when I was playing there, Coach Bishop went to Dallas Lincoln High School. 
and actually coached Chris Bosch there. And they went 40 and 0 and won the mythical national championship. And they were running all the same stuff that we did. Same plays, same system. And we were going 19 and 10 every year. And he went 40 and 0. And so at an early age, even as a college player, it kind of gave me an indicator of what we all know, right? It's like how important players are. And then um, played at Paris, um, went on, played the next two years at Texas A&M Commerce. I'm a Division II school here in Texas for Sam Walker. Um, he's the winningest coach in commerce history. And then um, was a GA there after that for two years. And really, to be perfectly honest, man, those were probably my two funnest years uh, coaching. I just made the transition from being a player to, to being a GA now and was so uh, young and immature and didn't know how hard things were really were in this business and we were like winning games and you know went to the elite eight on um, my second year there and it was really just the time of my life man you know and they say ignorance is bliss it really was I didn't know really what was going on what I was doing but it, it was fun and for me it was a blessing and I've told people this um because there's no blueprint how we all got here we all have different paths and one thing that was unique about being a GA at a division two level was that, um, you know, you got to be on the floor and coach as opposed to maybe a GA at, at the, at the highest level or is at our level now where you're doing maybe some, um, you know, a, a wide variety of things, but your coaching input isn't necessarily um, high. And that was one thing I was really appreciative of and probably helped shape, shape my career. Um, and then after my two years GA and went back to Paris as an assistant for Bill Foy, was a great coach who won a national championship at Paris Junior College in 05. I came back to be his assistant in 06. Um, and he, the first time he wanted me to come, I, I didn't really, wasn't sure if I wanted to go. Cause like I said, I was having the time of my life at Commerce, man. We were winning. We were going to be good again. I had met my wife who was just my girlfriend at the time. And I didn't really want to go. And he was like, Ross, if, you think you want to get in coaching. He's like, you need to do this. And it, it'll make or, or break you, you know, the, the junior college level. And got there, uh, was there one year as an assistant and just kind of got the, got lucky, man, got the break that, that uh, I needed. Coach Foy actually came to North Texas as this whole thing goes full circle. And I never thought in a million years that Coach Foy was going to leave. He had been there 10 years. And, um, he went to uh, North Texas and I got the Paris Junior College job when I was 25, like super, super lucky. Um, inherited a very good team, inherited a couple guys that were almost as old as me um, that I'm forever grateful for, man, because they, they really allowed me to, to take off that first year. And we had three good years, went to the national tournament my second year. Um, and then – uh, Grant McCaslin, who I work for now, was at Midland at the time. Young coaches, you know, getting to know each other. And he went to Midwestern State from Midland. He helped me get the Midland job. Went there for two years. Um, had two really good years at Midland. My second year got beaten in the national championship game um, by CSI. Pierre Jackson was really good. He was the best player on the floor. We couldn't guard him. Um, they beat us. And that was kind of around that time – you know, that I had kind of started getting the itch. I'd been a, a junior college coach for five years and made it to the national championship game, coached really good players, a couple NBA players, um, and started getting the itch. And um, it was at that time that I was really good friends with Greg Heyer. And we met when he was at Chipola, and I was uh, at Paris, and we became good friends. And he was at Southern Miss at the time, and they had, you know, they had a good team there. And he just took the Wichita State job. And he, he called and he was like, hey, Ross, I'm going to tell uh, Larry Eustachie was the coach at Southern Miss. And he's like, hey, man, I'm going to tell coach he needs to hire you. What is it going to take? Coach called me the next day. I went out there and, and we were at Southern Miss. Was at Southern Miss for only one year. We went there. We went to the NCAA tournament. Um, we got beat by Kansas State in Pittsburgh. It was in uh, Conference USA. It's when Memphis was really good. 
Central Florida, Tulsa. It was kind of the old Conference USA. And, um, you know, I, I, I tell Coach to this day, um, you know, and I know he won the Big 12 twice in a row when he was at Iowa State. And he'd done some great things at Utah State prior to that. And even at Colorado State, we had really good teams. But to me, personally, like his greatest coaching achievement was um, we got an at-large bid at Southern Miss, which was just crazy because they lived through uh, Katrina as well. Coach uh, Dixon, you mentioned that. And that hit Hattiesburg really hard, too. So they had to kind of start over as well. But went there one year. Um, coach got the Colorado State job from there. We go to Colorado State for four years, had had really good years there, went to the NCAA tournament, beat Missouri, got beat by Louisville the year they won the whole thing, had a really good team, had another, you know, set the school record for wins, uh, coached a lot of good players. And then Grant McCaslin, who was, you know, circling all the way back to the junior college side of things, which I'll talk about here in just a second. Uh, he got the Arkansas State job. He had been assistant at Baylor for five years, and he was like, hey, man, like, you know, come, come be the associate head coach and uh, went there. And it was a new experience uh, for him and I um, because most of the jobs that I had went to were already set up for success. And it was more of a, a maintaining and trying to elevate as opposed to trying to turn around a program and um, learned a lot through that experience. You know, we did some good things. We beat Georgetown that year. On the road, we were 23 and a half point underdogs, set the school, tied the school record for regular season wins. Was there just one year, and then North Texas opened up, and uh, Grant's from Irving. I'm from the Dallas area, and it was kind of a no-brainer for us. So came came here, similar situation. Um, you know, had to had to, you know, start over, so to speak. And uh, that first year, we won the CBI. Um, and then the second year, we kind of got hit by injuries really hard at the end, had the best start in school history, and then um, just got crushed by injuries late in the year, which we've all had to deal with. And then this last year, uh, reversal of fortune, um, we were as healthy as any team in the country. I think us and maybe Asheville were the only teams in the country to start the same starting lineup every game for every game we played in, and we won, won a conference championship this year in, in uh, 2020. So that's, you know, um, kind of my quick version of, uh, of where I've been, um, touch a little bit more on some things of the things I've learned, but any questions about any of that? I mean, I know I did most of the talking any, any questions about those stops or any, like any, anything along the way of that? I have, I have a question. Okay. Um, First of all, Matt Kinesnick, I'm a graduate assistant at uh, Central Michigan right now. Um, yeah, my question would be, when you, uh, when you got the job at 25 at uh, Parrish, what was the uh, most difficult thing about transitioning from an assistant to a head coach at such a young age at a high level of play like that? Um, that's a good question. You know, I, I, uh, I don't mean this um, – I don't mean it like arrogantly or anything right. like that. Um, Cause, uh, but I, I felt comfortable with the basketball part of it. Right. I, was, I wasn't a great player. I was a point guard, you know, so I kind of always had to think the game a little bit and I, and I felt comfortable. Um, I didn't necessarily know what I was doing, you know, but I right, knew, right. I knew what to do because yeah, Coach yeah. Boy was a really good coach mm -hmm. and Sam Walker was a really good coach. And so really I could just carbon copy their practice plans with uh with my you know my spin on things but uh so I felt comfortable with that my biggest fear at that age was something happening uh off the floor or uh, a, a behavior or a discipline issue and that being pointed back to my age right as a as a factor whereas if it was a older coach that had been coaching for 30 years at, you know, uh, Scott Jernander was at San Jack at the time, Pat Smith, who's at Moberly now was at Trini Valley at the time. I mean, like hall of fame coaches. And if a kid goes out and does something stupid on a weekend, it's kind of like those things happen. But right. I was, I was concerned if something like that happened on me, it's like, well, he's too young. He can't, he can't handle the players. So that was kind of like my biggest, um, concern, you know, as far as, as far as those things. But like I said, I had a very unique group 
Um, Ramon Clemente, who's, who to this day still plays for the Puerto Rican national team, uh, was older. He's from Queens, New York. He had got a GD. He was probably like two years younger than me. He was my best player. Didn't drink, didn't smoke, all in. You could coach him hard. He brought it every day, wanted to win. He went and played for Wichita State after that. He's, been, he's played pro for 13 years now. Wow. Had another guy that was uh, in the Air Force for four, four years. So, like, that first team that I coached was really one of the easiest teams I've ever been around. And so I was just really fortunate in that regard, man. And those dudes, like, I had good relationships with them. I did go from being the assistant that was protecting them and making sure they did everything to a new role. But they, because we had a good relationship, they wanted to, they wanted it to go well as well. That's good. Oh, Taj. Okay. Jonathan Maddox, Moorhead State. What's up, man? Hey, I was texting with Jareem earlier. I said, fill me in on Ross Hodge. And he texted me back three goats. He said, <laughs> it, it, he said, it's really simple. He said, just sit back with a pen and, and pad and take notes. I was like, okay, cool. Um, <laughs> my question though, obviously, you know, you're the associate head coach there. I think you've been the associate head coach at, at a few stops now. Um, what are some things you're doing, you know, personally and professionally to prepare yourself to take that next step and be a head coach? Um, man, that's, that's a great question. That was actually one of the things I was going to hit at the end of this, but I'll go ahead and get to it now. Um, during this time, this, this quarantine time, and I've had a chance to like listen to so many people, man. And, uh, that's one blessing that I think we've all probably took advantage of. And I've had a chance to really listen to some young coaches that have gotten opportunities to be head coaches. And one thing that they can really do is they can articulate their vision for a program in a very concise, simple manner. Um, and so even, even for me, I had to take a step back and I had to like, be honest, like, you know, in, in my, my evaluation during this time. And I'm like, man, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready to do that, to be honest. Like, I know I can coach, I know I can recruit, um, but can I sit in a room of six, seven administrators that, that have limited knowledge of the game of basketball and articulate a, a, a vision of program philosophy, a recruiting philosophy, um, you know, hey, tell us about, tell us about your academic plan, those type of things, and so, I don't know if you guys have ever had the opportunity to hear like Dennis Gates speak that was at Florida state forever. And he's at Cleveland state now. And he's done a lot of these. And if, I don't know if you can just YouTube it, but if you ever have a chance to see some, see him speak, man, he is elite level communicator and articulator for his vision for a program, you know, and um, coach Fisher at William and Mary, I heard him just, just kind of hearing, and he's like, man, you got to be able to have um, three and four word answers for people, you know, so, so they remember it and you don't start rattling on. So just having a clear vision for, hey, what's your basketball philosophy? You know, what's your recruiting philosophy? Um, you know, being able to articulate that to people that may not, because if you're in those situations, they know you can coach. So they don't want to hear you talk about how good you can coach. They want – so – for me personally, over this past time, that's what I've took a little time and I've really tried to spend time that we have it to do that, man, to sit down and take advantage of it and formulate ideas and words and a plan and a, and a vision and a CEO type mentality of a program. Cause we can all coach, man. Every, everybody on this knows what they're doing. And so um, that's, that's what I think is important, you know, kind of for like that next, next step for all of us that we got to be doing, you know, cause things happen so fast and we all think, man, it's not going to be this year. And then something happens. The next thing, you know, you're sitting in the room and you're like, you know, you better have a clear, clear plan and a vision and communicate it simply, very simple, you know? So, um, that was, that was actually the last thing I was going to hit, but I'm glad you asked. Yeah. Good stuff. Appreciate it. No problem, man. Hey, hey, Coach Hodge, Kareem Brown here from Niagara County Community College. Um, just to piggyback off of that, uh, you know, you say you're, you don't feel if you're ready. 
yet. What things do you think you need to, I guess, still accomplish or still put in your toolbox? You know, kind of a little thing that I say, you know, all the tools. What, what do you think you still need to work on or, or kind of figure out right now for yourself? That, that, that was really the, the biggest piece for me. Um, I'd, I'd been a head coach at the junior college level for five years. Um, coached really good players, won, won a lot of games. Um, I, feel, I feel comfortable and confident that Coach Mack is great to work for. He gives me a huge voice on the floor. And um, so, like I said, the basketball part I, I feel comfortable with. I'm all, you're, we're always learning, man, you know, like new ways to do things and, and new strategies and ways to get better in that regard. But the biggest thing for me – going back to like him was just being able to clearly communicate a vision for the program, you know, and in a way that is easily understandable to people, to, to the Dean of education. They, they may have been to five basketball games, but you're sitting there in the, in the room with them. Hey, we want to know your recruiting plan. How quick can you rattle it off? And, and that's what I've heard these people say. It better be like second nature, you know, um, what you want to do. So, you know, um, those, those, I think that's really important, especially with time. Cause none of us have really had it. We've always been blowing and going, going from the season to recruiting to summer workouts to fall workouts. But now you have a little time. I'd challenge everybody to sit down and think about, um, we have, we, we have a great program philosophy at, uh, North Texas that, that coach McCaslin came out, believe, serve, compete. You know, we're going to believe at a high level. Um, we're, we're never going to step into a situation where we don't believe that we can win games. And uh, we told them when we got here, man, we want, we want people to think we're crazy. You know, North Texas was coming off back-to-back 20 win, 20 lost seasons. They won six games. And we're going in there telling our team that, you know, we think we can win a national championship at North Texas. You know, we want people to laugh at us. Like, you know, and, and you got to have that type of belief. You know, we're going to serve each other. You know, um, our society teaches us all, right? Like the society we live in and what we see and what our guys are being told is you got to get yours, right? That's what we all, you got to get yours. You got to get yours. You got to get yours. It's, it's counterintuitive to what we want our teams to be. It's the opposite. So, you know, you're, we're constantly messaging, serve each other. You got to give to get, you know, you don't, you don't give, to, you know, you don't just take, you know, you, you give, the more you give, the more you get out of things. Um, and so, and then, you know, you got to compete at a high level every time you step on the floor, every, every day, you know, well, coach Mack has that. And it's great. So I've trying to been trying to figure out my own, you know, that I can take in, Hey, what's your basketball philosophy? You know, what's your recruiting philosophy? You know, what's your academic philosophy? You know, how are you going to decide who you're going to recruit? You know, um, and with like the serve component, we laugh about it. I told, I told Jareem this, but one of the things that drives me crazy is like the, the bet on yourself and double down, you know, you see kids say it and a lot of people say, Hey man, I'm just going to bet on myself and double down. And to me, it's probably the least accurate statement ever, you know, because you're, you're never betting on yourself and yourself alone. You know, you're betting on your staff. You're betting on the players that you recruit. You're betting on the people you work with. You're betting on your family. I mean, you're betting on a, a ton of people. You know, now I get it, what it means. It means you're going to put the work in and you're going to make it happen. But, I mean, you're betting on a lot of people. You ain't never just betting on yourself. Even, even people that play individual sports still have coaches that they got to work for. So, to me, for me, that's the biggest piece, man, just – being able to clearly communicate that stuff at a high level. Anybody else before we, before we get going? Um, three things I was going to touch base and I integrated it a little bit that I just feel like important um, were like relationships, right? And I know we all talk about relationships and I haven't got anywhere that I've been able to get that wasn't without just a, a very strong relationship. And I think for coaches and young coaches and even older coaches, man, we're so competitive. And as a young coach, I had to learn this 
you know, we're so competitive and you're competitive in recruiting as a junior college coach, you know, you're competitive and you want to win. Um, you know, you're getting in recruiting battles against people and, you know, you don't get a kid, you're pissed. And it's kind of easy just to go the negative route. But lo and behold, a couple years later, you make the move to the junior college level. Now you're wanting to go back and recruit those players, you know, and recruit those places and you're going to want their help. Um, so keep that in mind, man. Even, even at the division one level, you do not know um, who's watching you. You don't know what relationship is going to pay off at what point in time. Like I said, I was the head coach at Paris, and I got to know Coach Mack when he was the head coach at Midland. He won a national championship in 07. And we scrimmaged each other. We were competitors. We recruited the same guys, but we forged a good relationship. He goes, like I said, he goes from Midland to Midwestern. He, he helps me get the Midland job. Um, same thing with Greg Heyer. mentioned him earlier. You know, we were we were competitors, Midland, Chipola, uh, Paris, Chipola, but out on the road and just met him. And he was like, hey, you want this job? And and that happened like that, you know, and then Coach McCaslin gets, you know, the Arkansas State job. So um, keep that in mind, man, you know, as 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 you're out on the road is we're all we're all super competitive. We all want to win. But keep that in mind and and don't allow your competitive nature to get in the way of, of relationships and seek them out. You got to seek them out, man. Seek out relationships. Um, you know, you guys mentioned Jareem and, 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 and he connected Dave and I, you know, and um, he's great at that. You, you know, and I think young guys, young coaches, for whatever reason, they, you don't want to say they're entitled because that's a bad word to say, but, when I was when I was an assistant in junior college, man, I just started out with like a, a sheet of paper and I didn't know nobody and I didn't know shit from shit. I was a GA to I mean, I was a GA to D2 and now I'm assistant at Paris Junior College. And obviously a lot of coaches would come through there. I would meet them. I'd get their number. And I just started out with like a blank sheet of paper, like a blank sheet of paper. And I would just write their name and the number. And even though I'm a young guy, I'll be 40 in July. I mean, it was this, we didn't have cell phones yet. We had just started getting them and you still had to wait till like eight, you know, for your free minutes to kick in. Um, so, uh, but I just had a, and I would just, if I met him, I wrote his name. I didn't care how good I knew him. I didn't care how good he knew me. And I just started like a running Rolodex, man. And I would just call people and call people and call people and call people. And so I encourage young coaches, um, do the same, man. If you see them out on the road and you get a chance to meet them, you meet them one time, call them. If they don't call you back, call them again. Don't get offended. Everybody's busy. It's not personal. Don't, don't be like, well, I called him. He never called me back. You know, seek out relationships. You know, seek out people that are maybe followed similar paths as you did. Or you see your – I was a junior college coach at the time, and Jeremy Cox, who's the associate head coach at Stephen F. Austin now, was at Fort Smith, and he was at A&M. And then they went to Kentucky. That was somebody I was like, man, I got to get to know him. I have to get to know him. I want to know. He he has done a path that I want to do. And seek that out. So, um, you know, don't don't be too, like, cool and, and feel like, man, I hit him up one time. He didn't hit me back. And, no, man, seek it out. Keep calling. Keep calling. Keep calling. Um, and then the next thing I wanted to talk about was staff dynamics which I think is so important at, at, at the division one level. And I was coming from a junior college where it was just me and another assistant, you and another two assistants. And, and, you know, junior college is pure in a lot of ways. You have the politics of certain things. There was no rivals write-ups necessarily on who signed who and who recruited who and who did this and who did that, you know, and I really feel like that gets into the division one level. And, um, I had heard the horror stories, you know, about in-staff fighting and in-staff backstabbing and, you know, manipulating things behind the scenes. And I just always decided, man, that, like, I, that was not going to be anything that went on on any staff I was ever a part of, you know. And I was just always going to speak up against it. And I, had, I was very fortunate. The associate head coach when I was at Southern Miss in Colorado State was a guy named Leonard Perry. 
He's at Pacific now with Coach um, Damon Stoudemire. They just had a tremendous year. And I think they won 23 games, and they only had 10 scholarships. Um, and, and he's unbelievable. And he taught me so much. In particular, he taught me so much about being in the role that I am in now as an associate head coach. And he took every bullet. Every time something went wrong, every time Coach Eustacey was always like on a, you know, pissed, something was happening, LP always stepped in and he always said, hey, man, like, this, it's my fault. You know, it was, it was my fault. Um, it wasn't Ross's fault. It wasn't Nico's fault. Nico Medved is actually the head coach at Colorado State now. Um, and I always took that with me. And that's something that I've tried to do. And like with Jareem and Matt, and I tell them, hey, man, when you're in the when you're in the same situation, when you get your opportunity to be an associate head coach, you do the same. So anything that happens in our program that goes wrong, you know, and we all know shit goes wrong, um, I I try to bear the brunt of it, you know, and I have a lot of access a lot of access to coach, and we all know that it does not take much. Hey man, what happened with that? I mean, I don't know what so and so was doing. I don't know what Jareem was doing. I don't know why he did that. You know, and then you just stoke those fires. And, and so I, I learned that from Leonard, and I have took that with me, and I've tried to incorporate it with how we, how we run our own staffs. And um, I told our guys when we first got together, um, you know, Dave, and I guess Jareem's, you know, took me up on it, man, because he is uh, – he's one of a kind. But I told those guys, and it, and, and it was just us talking. I was like, look, man – Everybody, I'm sure most of the people on this are have thought about having, uh, you know, agents are in the are in the market for getting agents. When you get to this level, that's kind of a next step deal. But I told our staff, man, let let's be each other, let's be each other's agents. Let's be each other's agents, man. Let's sell each other harder than we ever sell ourselves. And if we have an issue with with something that one of us is doing, let's communicate with each other and not be afraid to call each other out on it, man. So it ain't going to be no, like I signed this guy. No, man, we signed this guy, you know, and let me say, Hey man, Jareem signed JV on Hamlet, the player of the year. You know, let me say, no, Matt Brower signed Terrence Lewis who we talked about earlier or, um, you know, uh, James Reese, you know, Matt got that done. You know, hey, how, how's Jareem to work with? And, and you know what happens when you take that approach? It actually becomes authentic. It's not even phony. It's not even fake. When you take that approach with your staff and you take invested interest in each other and you, you legitimately want to see other people do well and help them and build them up because we all have egos. And we're super competitive now. We're competitive in practice. We keep a... Uh, in Jareem's office, there's a there's a, a tally on the board on on who on who's won scrimmages against each other. We keep a running total. You know, I think Matt's up twelve to eleven over on Jareem, to be honest, at the moment. So it's not like we're not competing. And it's not like we don't have a healthy ego, but we have no unhealthy ego whatsoever, man. Um and I and it and it it starts at the top with Coach Mac. It's how he runs his program, trickles down into myself. And then it trickles into Matt and Jareem and it goes to our GAs, it goes to our student assistants and it goes to our players. So, and they can feel how together we are. So they can't even go. They can't even find a, a crevice in, or a creek in one of us. Like, man, what's up with the, uh, what's up with Coach Hodge, man? He's tripping. No, no, you know, and we have each other's back. For, for, for you that have kids, your kids know when you're, you and your wife are like fighting. They know. They know when everything ain't all right on the home front. Same thing with your players, man. They can feel it. They know if there's animosity or anxiety amongst the staff over BS. And, you know, I'm not saying you can't have success with that because obviously you can, but I think over the long haul, it's significantly harder to do so. So I think that's, I think that's a really important piece, man. You got to celebrate each other. You got to be each other's biggest advocates. You got to have each other's backs. Um, you know, because it doesn't take much to, you know, you're out on the road. Hey, what's, you know, how is, hey, how's Matt? You know, ah, you know, he's all right. Or, 
who signed so-and-so? Maybe he's a bad player. Maybe somebody signed a bad player on your team. You know, who signed him? You know, and, and just all the little things, the little infighting, which leads me to the most important piece, in my opinion, of this whole thing is uh, you got to win. You got to win, man. And, and we all want to advance in our careers. We all want to move, whether it's move to a higher level assistant. We all want to make more money. Um, and I shared this with our staff. The biggest raises I've got through my coaching career is because we were one. We won, and it maybe was the least – maybe I had the least amount to do with those situations. I went to Southern Miss from Midland. And I signed one, one player because the team was already there. They were good. They had their team coming back. I brought in one player. He was a good player. He was all league. Um, but then we go to Colorado State. I get a ginormous raise. We go to Colorado State. We inherit a very good team. We inherit a NCAA tournament team. Um, we go to the NCAA tournament, break the school record for wins. But we, didn't, we recruited a couple guys on that team. And then we go into a tournament and we get another big raise. And then, you know, we, uh, you know, we had a lot of turnover. We didn't have as good a year. And we recruited all of them and we didn't get a raise. So I know we all feel like you, you have to show what you're doing from an individual standpoint, but if you just be about winning, man, and try to help, help your programs win. And if you look at been really fortunate, man, the people that I've worked with assistants, like I said, Nico Medved is now the head coach at Colorado state. Leonard Perry is the associate head coach at Pacific. James Miller came to Arkansas state with us, spent one year at North Texas. He's the associate head coach at New Mexico state. They ain't lost a conference game in about five years. Um, you know, our staff now, Jareem Dowling, who, a lot of you guys know, and he's, he's took major advantage of this time. He's been on a lot of platforms. He's, like I said, if there's somebody with a, a better heart than that dude, I want to meet him, you know, and he's, he's a, he's a tremendous person and people have no idea how good of a basketball coach is, he is because he deflects so much onto other people. And he's such, he's so giving, he's so willing to, to share, but he's coached the Virgin Islands national team a senior team and they've medaled and had the highest finishes in FIBA tournaments ever. And he's a star, Matthew Brower on our staff, you know, who uh, is from Texas. He played at Wichita state started on the year. They went to the sweet 16. He's been at Maryland as a video guy. He's been at Sam Houston. He's, he's, this is his going on his third year with us here. And he's like Scottie Pippen, man of, of, of the bulls. You know, he just, he does it all, man. He can recruit at a high level. He worked for me at Midland. Um, and you know, he can recruit at a high level. He can coach. He was at college of Star Charleston for a few years before he came here. Um, so yeah, man, just, uh, been really fortunate. Grant McCaslin, who I work for now is unbelievable. Uh, Larry Eustace, um, you know, Sam Walker, just elite level people, great coaches. So, um, that's, that's my take. Um, I know it wasn't, you know, anything probably you haven't heard before. Um, but relationships, man, staff dynamics, and then just, uh, whatever you, whatever you do, man, you know, be about winning and trying to help, help your program win. And I promise you, if your program wins, opportunities are open up for you financially. They'll open up for you, uh, to move into better job situations or, or just improve your own job. So, um, if you can ask any questions about that. You can ask any questions that aren't about a topic I, I talked about. I mean, really, whatever you guys got, man. Um, or if we're ready to – you guys have heard enough of me talking, ready to move on to Coach Dean and Coach Dixon, I'm cool with that too. So, fire away. Uh, Coach, I got another question. Okay. Um, so, you talked about the relationships uh, aspect of things, obviously – um, from when you were a junior college head coach. And now I'm moving from a position where I started off coaching at a high-level prep school and on the EYBL circuit, and now I'm a graduate assistant, right? So mm -hmm. you're not on the road anymore. And 
you know, coaches, you, it's not like you have players for them to recruit anymore. So, like, obviously, when you were a JUCO coach, you know, you formed a lot of your relationships, I'm sure, through guys wanting to recruit your players. How would you um, say a good way to go about building relationships would be when you're not on the road or, in, you know, either sports staff or old division one? Um, man, I think you just got to seek them out, man. Yeah. Like, I, I know that's, that's what's so awesome about these platforms. They've given people opportunities to kind of put – names and faces together a little bit and right. I'm sure you've heard, you know there's a, a lot of people you probably met through this and even even you and I here now you know and just seek those seek those relationships out man you know and like I said don't be afraid to don't be afraid to 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 seek out and ask questions you know I think a lot of times for young coaches you want to portray that you you know what you're doing and, you know, I, I know, and you want to prove to people you can do it, but man, be vulnerable, be hungry, you know, don't, don't shy away from, like I said, man, you know, don't, don't get discouraged if you call somebody a couple of times and they don't hit you back and you're like, Oh, they don't, they don't want to, you know, they don't, I don't want to bother them, but just keep at it, man. Keep seeking, right. seeking out relationships and opportunities, you know, will come for sure. Appreciate that. No. Hey, Coach. Uh, Carter Heston from uh, Texas A&M, Texarkana. I know you briefly talked about um, being 23 and a half point underdogs. I don't know what point in your career that you were at when you guys beat Georgetown. Were you at North Texas or – sorry. I Arkansas, Arkansas State. Okay, Arkansas State. Um, kind of something like being a head coach at lower levels and not having as much, uh, you know, exposure to point spreads and stuff like that. Do you ever use that to motivate your guys? You know, say we're we're huge underdogs tonight. People feel like they're counting us all out. You know, let's let's uh, use that competitive edge in some yeah. way. Or is that something that's more taboo? Because obviously now there's just so much exposure to it. And, just wanted to see what, what you thought about that. Yeah, man. Uh, Coach Eustachie, who I worked for for five years, when, for one year at Southern Miss, four years at Colorado State, he would talk to our teams about the line all the time. You know, and he would use it if we were – say you were playing Air Force at home and it's a game you should win, but you're seven-point favorites. You know, he would just tell our guys. Like, he, he'd probably lowball it a little bit and be like, hey, man, you're only five-point favorites. Like, it's just two baskets, guys. I'm just telling you, man, like – there ain't that much difference between them and us, you know, but on a, on a, on a big spread like that, you know, no, nah, we never really did. And coach Mack doesn't, but like you said, players now, they know, you know, cause all you got to yeah. do is like, you click on your ESPN app and you're scrolling through it. And it just says like, uh, you know, just says, you know, North Texas minus three and a half or plus two. And um, so it is interesting, you know, but the biggest the biggest difference for me, Paris had won a national championship when I got that job. Midland had won a national championship when I got that job. When I went to Southern Miss, they had back-to-back -back 21 seasons. We just went to the NCAA tournament. When I went to Colorado State, we inherited an NCAA tournament team. When we went to Arkansas State, we inherited a team that won 10 games. So even so, – so you – the shift went from like – basically trying to convince your teams that you could get beat <laughs> because yeah. the expectation level was so high and they had won so much and you're sitting there telling them like, no man, we can lose this game. And then you had to go and shift, which was new for me personally and coach Mac. Now you're trying, now you're having to get guys to believe that they can go beat somebody and maybe they don't know if they can believe. So you can't, you did have to, change how you approached even your own players you know you weren't dealing with super confident teams that maybe you could beat down a little bit because you knew in the back of their mind they're like man we're winning this game you're going into situations now where they don't know if they're going to win the game so but that was a fun night it was a perfect storm too they had just played maryland in the uh what's is that what's that what's the uh, arena where the wizards play verizon center Anybody know? Verizon Center, I think. Anybody know DC, Baltimore guys? But anyways, so they had just they had just blew a 10-point lead with a minute to go on Tuesday against Maryland. 
they were leaving. We played them on a Thursday. The next morning, they were leaving to go to Maui for, for the Maui Invitational. Look at and, that, yeah. And the, the Verizon Center was being used for a concert, so we had to play in an on-campus gym. And they just weren't quite ready to go. We jumped on them early, and then we hung on for dear life at the end. But it, it was a fun night. What's up, Ross? Lucas McKay. It's uh, Capital One Arena is the what it's called now. It was Verizon at Thank the time you, in D.C. No problem. What's one thing as, as a, with a, having a JUCO background, one thing you've learned from that experience that sticks with you today and you think about or relate back to at some point every day, every week, every season? Um, that um, – couple things one comes to mind you know in in juco you can have some you can have some pretty crazy days and it can feel like the end of the world is near you know it can it can feel like you know you're never going to get past this day and it's just you know and then and then a new day comes and it's and you know and like I'm sure as coaches we've all had those experiences where you just like you just feel like man this is you know, we're just dejected, you know, maybe you lose a player to ineligible, maybe you have to get rid of a guy, maybe just, we've all experienced those low, low moments, man. And a lot of times, you know, you bounce back from those quicker than you think. And, um, but other than that, man, just, uh, that it's the game, the game is the same, you know, at any level, high school, Juco, division one, division three, you know, like, uh, it's, it's a game, you know, now at our levels, there's a lot more exterior factors pulling, but the bottom line is, is that, you know, you put a team out there, you try to get them going in the same direction. And that's why I think I, I'm super thankful for my Juco playing background. And is, as a player, I mean, I, there were games I'd play two minutes. We had really good teams and there was games when I was at the division two, I played at that I played 40 minutes 45 minutes of an overtime game and never came off the floor, you know, and I, I can say that shaped me as a player. And I was kind of a punk as a player. I'm not going to lie. I had a chip, you know, could be a little edgy. Um, I get pissed at my coaches and stuff, but I never, I never took it out on my teammates. I was always supportive of my teammates. And I've shared that story with our players through the years. Like, look, man, if you're not playing as much as you want, I don't expect you to, to be happy. I mean, if you're happy about it, go play it in a murals, you know, but don't be mad at uh, James Reese because he's playing and you're not. You can be mad at me, but support him, man. That That's your guy. You guys like each other, you know, so that 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 was something that I've always kind of took from Juco. Awesome. Well, shoot, Coach Hodge, I appreciate it. Um, it's been really good. Um, a lot of good information, and uh, thank you for sharing with us. And hopefully, you know, I know a lot of people had some some good notes. I was getting some texts about people having good notes. So uh, I appreciate you um, coming on and being willing to share your insights from your journey with us. Um, so, Coach Hodge, I really appreciate you. Oh, man, thank, thank you. Uh, enjoy everybody. Like I said, um, I'll uh, I'll put my number in the chat, or if you got something you can write down, my cell is 903. And, Dave, you can share this with guys, too, if they ask. 366-9245. And, like I said, man, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a learner as well. So, I love to learn. I love to talk hoops, man. I do not have it even halfway figured out. So, um you know, like I said, man, don't, don't hesitate if you got questions, if you want to – I know this was more non-basketball type stuff, but if you want to talk hoops or any, anything about that, man, you can, you can reach out and I'll do the same. Awesome. I appreciate that, Coach Hodge. Uh, really enjoyed your, your insight and stuff with us. So, next up, I'm going to go uh, to Coach Reynolds Dean at Clemson. Gotten the chance to meet Coach Dean the past couple of years and – Get to know him, obviously being a South Carolina guy, myself, uh, getting to know him at, at Clemson. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Coach Reynolds-Dean. 
Thanks, David, man. Thank, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, for, thanks for everyone that, that took time out of their busy schedule tonight. I see the coronavirus is kind of getting lifted now. We got a lot of people here, so <laughs> thank you guys for coming out. Uh, you guys got it's a diverse crowd, which I really like, uh, especially with what's, with, 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 with what's going on right now in our country. I think this is a great platform. A uh, little bit about my journey. Uh, probably won't be as interesting as Coach Hart because mine was probably, you know, <laughs> a little easier and a little simpler. But um, I'm originally from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I'm, I'm that underdog guy, that six five guy that kind of nobody wanted down south. And uh, I actually, you know, Coach Dickinson is on here. He recruited me a little bit as well. So uh, I ended up at the University of Rhode Island from Atlanta, Georgia. So go figure. Uh, that's kind of how my how my story probably starts, you know, being a Southern guy going out of my comfort zone to New England. I uh, had a really good career. Uh, had a really, really good career, had a lot of success. I uh, played for two great head coaches, uh, Al Skinner and Jim Herrick. Uh, went to the Elite Eight, you know, played with a lot of pros. Uh, and then I took my talents over, like these guys say, took my talents overseas. I played 10 years over in Spain. So uh, like just like Coach Hall had his, like at 25, I was still playing. I retired at 32 uh, and I got into coaching. And uh, I, I see a lot of guys on here right now, some high school coaches and some, you know, GAs. Uh, it's a couple of ways you can get into coaching uh, in, in, in my experience with it. You're either going to be a player like I was and somebody remembered you for what, you know, all the blood, sweat, and tears you gave them. Uh, you're either going to be a connected guy, meaning uh, I'm connected with this AAU program. Uh, my brother is married to that woman who is the AD. Some kind of way you're going to be, a, you're going to be connected. And then you have a, a, a hard working hard-working, gritty guy who works his way up and everybody recognizes him. And that guy <clears throat> can get in, get in that way as well. So those are kind of the three ways. So when I, when I finished my professional career at 32, I had <clears throat> I had the uh, unlucky, the most lucky story you can have. My head coach, Al Skinner, I uh, was the head coach at Boston College. Uh, assistant coach who recruited me, Bill Coyne, was the head coach at Northeastern University. Tim O'Shea was the other assistant coach. He was the head coach at uh, Ohio U. And Ed Cooley was the head coach at Fairfield. So go figure, my entire staff that I played for at the University of Rhode Island, they were all head coaches. So, so I, it was kind of easy for me to get in because those guys, they knew me. I didn't have to, uh, you know, really interview or anything like that. They just asked me, did I want to, did I want to coach? And I met them down in San Antonio at the Final Four. And, and lo and behold, I was director of operations at Fairfield University for Ed Cooley. Um, it was a great six months there. Uh, I learned a lot. I uh, got a first piece of my humble pie, uh, like, like two weeks on the job. Uh, call me Masariello was a, he was a Dobo. No, he was a AAU coach with the City Rocks. <clears throat> and I don't know if you guys know Rick. I forget Rick's last name. He was at DePaul. Uh, forget his name. But anyway, he left. And I'm in a Dobo slot. I'm thinking Ed Cooley's my friend, my buddy. He's just going to bump me up to be a coach. And uh, he didn't do that. So that was like my first taste of humble pie. And I learned a lot. And the one thing I remember about that situation was Ed Cooley said, uh, I want you to learn every single position in an office before you become a head coach. And that's something that stuck with me in like my first six months of coaching. So I was the director of operations. And uh, that's why I started developing my, you know, passion for coaching. Because when you play 10 years overseas and you're used to making good money, and then you come and you're adobo making like 18,000 18, and you're running camps and you're doing all this administrative work. You can't get on the floor. It kind of tests your patience a little bit. And that year, I will say that year is, is what, what, what got me here today.
and I spent six months there and then I got the job at Northeastern University with Bill Coyne who actually recruited me. Uh, I stayed five years there and um, just like I, I, I learned a lot with Ed Cooley, I learned even more with Bill Coyne. I stayed with him for five years at Northeastern. Uh, we was in the CAA. Uh, some of you guys probably don't remember the old CAA with VCU, Old Dominion, George Mason. I mean, we had, you know, two of those teams went to the final four out of our uh, out of our conference. And I, I would say uh, with, with Cooley, I, I had some humble pie. And with Coach Corn, that, that's when I learned my, my most about coaching. Uh, I, I learned to recruit. And with him, <clears throat> he had a saying that stuck with me and I'll never forget it. He all, I got it in my office right now. And we, we were talking about recruiting. Uh, he said, measure twice and cut once. And at the first, I didn't really understand what he was trying to say. I just go to the gym, see a guy, oh, I think we can get him. He's like, no, Tom, he's not, you know, he's, he's, this kid is from Virginia. He's not coming all the way to Boston when he can go to VCU. So I had to think outside the box. It forced me to think outside the box. And, and that's why I kind of developed my eye for recruiting. Uh, he, he taught me how to evaluate. He taught me relationship building. He taught me how to just get engaged with kids <clears throat> before they get on campus. He taught me a lot. Those five years of kind of being that underdog when you got a battle against VCU and Old Dominion and, and those guys, it's like, how are you going to catch them? And we caught them. We caught them because we uh, we were forced to evaluate. We were forced to pick the right kids. And it was the kids that, frankly, nobody really wanted. And guys that are playing for money right now. So uh, that's what I learned from that. And then uh, without coaching, you're not going to have some adversity. So uh, five years, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, I was in Boston for five years. And uh, I, I couldn't move the needle. I, I interviewed at Nebraska, I interviewed at Vandy, I interviewed at a lot of these places because we were winning. Just like Coach Ross said, we were winning. And uh, so I had to take another route. I took the job at College of Charleston uh, with Doug Wojcik. And, and, and lo and behold, uh, two weeks into the job, I woke up to the most text messages I ever had in my life and Twitter going crazy. So. You know, in two weeks on the job, I just left a, I just helped build a program who was picked to win the conference, but I just felt like it was nothing more for me to do. I take the job at College of Charleston, trying to chase, you know, a little money, some more, you know, get closer to home. And in two weeks on the job, Doug Wojcik, I wake up and he's fired. So just imagine that, leaving the top team in the conference, going to another team in the same conference, Two weeks on the job, boom, your whole life can change. So, you know, he, he, he got into, I know you guys well documented for all the things that happened. Um, cut the long story short, he gets fired. Uh, and the AD came up, came in and he said, he, he named me the interim head coach. And that's when it was sort of like a blessing in disguise for me. I wasn't waiting on, I wasn't waiting on it. It's like Ross said, I wasn't really prepared for it but I was the academic advisor. I was doing workouts by myself. I was counseling kids. I was with the parents, uh, just everything doing the budget, everything that had to do with the ins and out of a program, I did it. And I wouldn't trade that experience for nothing. And uh, maybe a month into it, um, Earl Grant gets the job and uh, I'll never forget it. He called me on a Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, he told me to be in the office at eight o'clock in the morning. So I was there at seven and the rest was history. You know, two days later, we driving down to Orlando to go get Grant Riller. So I say, you always gotta be prepared. That, that situation taught me, you always gotta be prepared for whatever situation arrives. So when Earl Grant got the job, he immediately said, hey, it's recruiting, we missed July period, who are we getting? But I had, I was the only coach in college in Charleston that was going out, so I had, Got and wrote, learned everything I learned from Northeastern. I had 30 guys ready. So we meet at 8 o'clock in the morning. He said, you ain't got to explain your story. I know who you are. I heard a lot about you. I know you're a hard worker. Let's go. As soon as, as soon as he sat down, I had a list of guys ready. I was prepared. 
And, you know, two days on the job, Thursday, we, we driving down to Orlando to get Grant Rilla, who now is going to get drafted in the NBA. And, and it goes back to what I was saying about the recruiting part, you know, just having an eye for talent and learning, some, learning something from every stop that you make. And I can remember it like, like it was yesterday. It was Kerry Blackshear, Matt Milan. It was all these guys on this, this little Q16. And I said, who's that skinny kid right there with the flat top? Nobody was recruiting him. And now he's a 2,000 point score about to get drafted in the NBA. So what I'm, <clears throat> what I'm encouraging you guys is to always learn something from every spot. And I stayed there for six months. And uh, like, like I told you guys before, I played at the University of Rhode Island and they hadn't been to the tournament since my senior year. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember Lamar Odom hitting the shot at, against Temple, the 3 2 1 shot. I was on that team. I actually caught the ball in the net and started running. So, uh, <clears throat> had a chance to get back and, and go up to Rhode Island uh, and to do something special. Uh, that was my alma mater. You know, my heart pumps Rhodey Blue. And, it was a chance to work for a good, good head coach, Dan Hurley. Uh, the program was already going in the right direction. Uh, they just needed help with getting over the hump. And me being the person that I am, I, I just wanted to do that for my alma mater. But in that situation, it was the hardest coaching situation of my career. Um, he was very demanding and I wasn't used to that. And that was the only time I, I was caught off guard in my career, going into a situation where I've been working for a lot of guys that were, that I knew. And working with uh, Dan Hurley was one of the best experiences for me because it, it taught me to get outside of my comfort zone. And his big thing was standards, all right? So my standards were, hey, this is my position group. Hey man, we, you know, we, we second in the league and rebounding and block shot. No, we should be first. You know, and, and those are some of the things I learned from him. Now, we didn't always agree on everything, but he pushed me and pushed me and pushed me, and I got out of my comfort zone. And um, that allowed me to uh, be where I am, to, I am today. And that's down here at Clemson University. Uh, you know, it was in the up and down, up and down, but it was one of those jobs where I knew I could flourish. I've been that underdog guy kind of throughout my whole life, when it, whether it was – the sick, sick kid that nobody wanted, boom, uh, Rhode Island, we win, you know. Whether it was Northeastern going up battling against VCU and Old Dominion, whether it was Rhode Island that hasn't been to the tournament since 1999, whether it's, man, Clemson, man, you're battling the so-called giants of college basketball. So that's kind of my story. Um, and that's, and I, 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 I kind of call myself the ultimate underdog I'm still one of those guys right now. I think my next stop, like I want to be a head coach. And right now, I may not be the guy that's, you know, all over Twitter. I don't have a check by my name, but I think a lot of guys know me and they respect me in the business. So uh, any questions you guys have right now? I know I spoke a lot. I know I went through college and overseas and things like that. So. Uh, my journey was kind of different. I'm giving you guys a different journey because I know Ross was Juco. You know, I'm probably the, the on the player side that got kind of lucky with some of the coaches that I knew. I got a question for you, Coach. Okay. Um, you said that uh, Coach Hurley kind of pushed you outside of your comfort zone a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just elaborate on – I mean, you don't have to go into, like, grave detail or anything but can you just talk about maybe some areas that he like you said he he forced you to you know whatever the, whatever that was that kind of you felt like even helped you elevate to where you are now yeah well to give you a, a back story on it like you know Ed, I don't know if you guys Ed Cooley, Bill Corn, Earl Grant those are kind of fun environment uh I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word relax, but I would say it was player friendly. If that yeah. was, if you, if you, Dan is totally opposite. It yeah. is, you're down there with your guys. Practice started at three, it's 2.45, you're down there shooting with guys. 
he walks in, everybody uptight immediately. And me, I'm not used to that. I'm like, no. We, we, that's just an example of like yeah. he had everybody's, like everybody, would, I wouldn't say scared of him, but they had the ultimate respect for him. Uh, just little things like drills, like he was a stickler on the time and everything had to be paced and you could not walk. I'm talking could not walk. If it was a drill and if you didn't run to the next drill, everybody running, everybody running. Like things like that, uh, what is recruiting? Like, mm -mm. he don't want the, the kind of guy that I was used to recruiting, the Northeastern, the, 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 the little guy with a chip on his shoulder. No, I want, if Boston College and Providence and Seton Hall want him, we want him. Mm. And it's like, he forced you to like, no, we, no, standards. Yeah. These are the standards we have for this program. We don't want the three star. We want the four star. And that kind of got me out of my comfort zone. And, you know, we kind of clashed a little bit on that because <clears throat> I wasn't always the confrontational guy. And he loved confrontation. And that got me out of my comfort zone. So now when I come down to Clemson, I'm ready now. Yeah. And without those two years, I don't think I would be here right now. Just... I, I can't go all the way in detail with like no. certain examples, but it just, you know, okay, you, we, we recruiting this guy and you're the lead and we didn't hit him. He wouldn't talk to you for a week. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like he, he walked right by you. Yeah. Talk to you for a week. It was that kind of environment. Like you had to be on your stuff. Yeah. You know, if it was a project, if it was a scout and you don't watch four, five, six games, and you miss one detail, he gonna let you know after the game, the next day in film, in front of the team, like he was demanding. He was, I want perf perfect, as close to perfect as you can get. Yeah. That's who he was. Good stuff. Coach, I had a question. Okay. Um, what do you think uh, the biggest adjustment was for you when you're going from that ops role to getting back on the floor? I mean, obviously you played at a high level and mm -hmm. stuff like that, but you hadn't coached, right? Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just, obviously there's a difference between playing and coaching. So I was just curious what you thought the biggest adjustment was there. Just, just listening and learning. Uh, you, you think that, you know, I was watching the last dance with Michael Jordan. You think that because the way you played, that you expect these guys to do the same thing that you did. And that was my crash course on coaching. Like, dude, you can't grab that rebound? Now, mind you, I was a great rebounder, and I couldn't understand why these guys, they, they couldn't rebound. Just, just, trying, just trying to wrap your mind around you're not playing anymore. To get your, the hardest thing to do coming from a player to a coach is get your mindset away from that you are the player and to, the, to being a coach and you have to teach and you have to develop, that's the hard part. Because as, a, as your own person, as a player, you have standards. So if my free throw percentage is at 60%, me as a, a, a competitor, as an individual, I'm gonna, go in the, I'm gonna go in the gym on my own. Now on the coaching side is how can you relay that message to get this guy to go in the gym and do it on his own who doesn't have that self-drive, that self-motivation. So I would say that was the hardest part for me was just turning off that player mode. And it all started when I was in the ops, ops, ops position where I couldn't get on the floor. I was itching, couldn't work guys out. And when I finally got my chance, it was like, hey man, you're not really ready. Like you haven't, you haven't did a Zoom call or went to a coaching's clinic and you haven't put together a scouting report. It's easy to sit back and the ops in a GA role, I'm telling you this, listen to this. It's easy to sit back and say, I can do better than that coach. He don't know what he's doing. And to when you got to get up that first couple of times in front of that team and explain to them what they got to do in the scouting report. It's, it's you think, that, oh man, we got some bad players here. Why can't we recruit better players? Until you get out there and you see when them guys ain't calling you back and ain't picking up your phone call. So 
I would say sit back and learn more, do more listening than talking and just sit back and take notes. And obviously you're going to do it your own way and find ways to be more interactive. But, you know, I would say sit back and just listen and learn. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. How are we doing, Coach? Manny speaking from Orangeville, Canada. Quick question, just to touch base on what you said. Um, how do you go? You've been at different levels now, you know, being at Northeastern and, you know, now at Clemson and every, in between. How do you go about that when recruits aren't answering your calls or texts and um, kind of what's your approach? Oh, that's a good question, man. Uh, recruiting has changed so much. Um, it's funny, like Coach was saying about the – he had to write, write all the numbers down, the, the free time at the 8 o'clock. I remember those days. Um, it's funny what I'm about to say. It was easier before social media, and it's crazy to sound. You can go to a game and be on a kid that you know is so good. But now, if a kid you got – if a kid's in that game and he has 18 points, if he get interviewed by rivals or somebody, instantly he's on Twitter. Then every because 80% of these coaches they they social media recruit. Whoever is on the timeline, that's who they kind of put in their database and uh that's who they choose to recruit. So it's it's gotten harder. Uh and it's even harder now, like when you every level you go up, you gotta get a better player. So right now in the ACC, uh, you're going to have a lot of people that's going to call you and say, hey, man, you got to stay away. From you. This guy is good enough to play for y'all. And you got to ask them, what does that mean for y'all? You know, he, he's good enough for you, but he, you won't send him to Duke. You won't send him to North Carolina, but he's good enough for you. You got to be careful of, of those kind of guys. And you got to trust your own eyes, man. Trust your gut. And sometimes your, your gut is going to scare the shit out of you, but you got to go with it and you got to trust it, man. Now, I've made some of my best decisions when I wasn't 100% sure, but it was something that I saw in the kid that, uh, that I really, that I really, like, this, this draw me, drew me to him. If it's a guard and, you know, I was a big man, if it's a guard, if I want to get out of my seat and play with you, man, that, that's a good sign. That's a really good sign. And you got to just trust your eyes. And I kind of break it down into like three categories for me personally. Uh, it's talent, uh, it's character, and it's toughness. If you got two of the three, no matter what level you're at, you're going to make it. You know, it's a, it's a lot of guys that's talented, but they ain't tough, and they'll knock ahead. They ain't going to make it. You may have a guy who's not as talented, but if he got, he's a high character kid, meaning he work hard, go to class, he never talk back to his coach, just, just a high character kid, and he tough, he gonna make it. Somehow, some way, he's gonna make it. So I just think in that recruiting, you gotta have a philosophy. Appreciate it, coach. Okay. Hey coach, another question about uh, recruiting. Um, obviously, like you said, it's just hard to, to keep secrets in today's day and age. A guy might blow up and get 15, 20 offers in a couple weeks. And so do you guys like have a certain point, especially when you're at, at Charleston and at some of the mid-major schools in which like you might have your eye on a guy, been talking to him for a long time, and where you kind of have to, you feel like you have to not give up on them, but you feel like, you know, I don't, I don't have a fighting chance anymore just because of something that, that happened. Obviously, like guys like Grant Rill or some of them just don't get discovered and then turn it, turn out to be just amazing. I think he only had like three or four D1 offers. But what do you do with the other guys who really get a lot of exposure and uh, start moving up up the ranks? Well, I think uh, most staffs around the country have a wish list, per se. Uh, you know, you're going to recruit. You're going to have your top guys, your, your category A. Category B, and nobody really wants to get the category C. So, um, if it's a player you really, really like, and, and he's trending towards, uh, like, the, for example, I was <laughs> just just happened to me. I was recruiting this kid. You know, some of you guys may know him, Duntrell Styles. He's on there for a year, flying in and out to Kinston. So I didn't even know what Kinston, North Carolina, was, and you know, humble. 
you know, humble kid, good family, Clemson type kid, underdog, everything was going good. Uh, North Carolina called and offered him. Three weeks later, he committed. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like those things are going to happen. The more you recruit, those things are going to happen. So you just got to have, you You always got to have your uh, uh, A, B, and C guy. You always got to have that. And you got to, rec- and it's funny, and it's, it's a mistake a lot of guys make. You have to recruit all of them the same. As crazy as that sounds, you got to recruit all of them the same because it changes, you know, not, now, that we, now that we got the virus and we're not out there, but it changes from game to game. Like not, it used to change from week to week. Now it changes from game to game. Like a guy can, uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning, he can have 15. He's still in there. He texts you back. Everything good. He had 25 at Peace Jam at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's over. So it stay, you got you to gotta recruit all those guys as if they were the guy. And some people put all their eggs in one basket. I'm not that way. Some people recruit the top 50 McDonald's All-American. And the other little guys, they don't show them no respect because they just think they can get them at any time. I recruit all three of them the exact same way because you never know when you – you never know what's going to happen. It's so fluid, man. Like, recruiting is so fluid at each level. And trust your gut. And, and I go back to what Bill Cohen always said. Measure these kids twice. Measure them twice. Make sure. Uh, it's all about – another thing I tell you, it's all about you need – this is recruiting in a nutshell. It's all about your need. It's all about what polo you're wearing and who you work for. And the third one is who can you get? And I think if you kind of have that going into it, you won't waste a lot of time and you'll get the kids that fit your program and fit what you're about and the kids that really want to be with you and believe in what you got to sell. Coach D. Thanks, Coach. Okay. Jonathan Maddox, Moorhead State. What, what was that quote? Uh, two questions. You said measure twice. What was the second part of that quote? Measure twice and cut once. And cut once. Okay. Gotcha. And then um, at, at Clemson, do you guys, do you have like certain states or regions you're responsible for? How do, how do y'all break up recruiting or, or do y'all just recruit based on the relationships you and the other assistants have? I think a little bit of both. Uh, me being from Georgia, I try to recruit the state of Georgia, and uh, we had a, you know, we had a uh, guy on our staff in the previous uh, three years that I was here who covered the state of South Carolina. But now we're trying to do it uh, as a group. Uh, we're trying to, you know, improve that relationship, and uh, you know, your breadbasket. So we we try to try to do it all. I mean, I'm one of those guys where my background allows me. I just told you I coached. At Northeastern for five years, so I had all the prep schools up that way. I coached at Rhode Island for two, so seven out of my 12 years, I've been in New England, so I had to recruit, you know, Philly on up, and then I was at Charleston and then Clemson, where I can, where I'm Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, so I'm not, the, I'm not big on this is my state, this is your state, um, it's whoever, whoever can get the best guy, you know, like, you know, we got a point guard from Jersey and a two guard from Atlanta. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't per se a region. I'm just different that way. I walk through the gym and I just look for guys who I think can who fit. Uh, if you got some guys that you go back to the connected guys, they just, you know, if I'm from Philly, I'm recruiting Philly and DC and that's it. You know, it's hard to, you know, what about you get a job at Miami? So you're going to say, oh, all I do is recruit Philly and D.C. I don't know nobody in Florida. You got to reach out. And I think that was the best thing about me working at Northeastern is that I recruited Texas. I got kids to come from Texas to go to uh, Boston, Alabama, Georgia. So, and that's when I developed a lot of relationships. Some of these people that's on the Zoom call, uh, you know, I met when I was in, Boston versus being in right in that area. So don't limit yourself to one area. Don't be a guy that just, you know, you, you, if a job comes open and you, you tell me I'm a head coach and you tell me, hey, man, I'm from Texas. 
I just recruit Houston and Dallas. Yeah, but I got a job in James Madison and in Virginia. So, how, you know, have you ever recruited this way? Do you know anybody this way? I think you got to just branch out and try to reach different areas in recruiting. So even if your head coach tells you to, hey, only recruit wherever you're from, Tennessee, Kentucky, just still branch out and make relationships with those guys because you never know. Thanks. Coach Dean, how are you? Good. Good. Please tell my, my guy, Anthony Goins, I said hi. Okay. Uh, Kareem Brown from Niagara County Community College. Um, you're putting together staff. You said you're ready now to be a head coach. You're putting together a staff. Mm -hmm. Kind of what direction would you go? Would you go with guys that are going to um, fit some differences and some things that you struggle with? Or are you looking for guys that you have relationships? How would you put your staff together? I think a little bit of both. Um, like I said, my journey, and like I said in my journey, you got to be prepared for every situation and you need help along the way. And I've never been a head coach. So I would, I think I would lean more towards having a guy that's called a timeout before my staff because I never, I never done it. Uh, I'm not the guy that got this big old, the big ego to say, hey, I got it all figured out. No, I think I would hire me a uh, ex former head coach. Uh, I'm not the biggest organized guy, so I, I think uh, that answered answer part of your question about uh, like when you know when. If I'm not the it's great organizer to kind of get somebody that can help me be organized. But once again, it goes back to the recruiter. Uh, if the only thing you got to bring to the table is that you're an organizer, it's probably ain't going, you know, that I, you, you got to be organized. You got to recruit. You got to, you got to be a three level assistant. You got to be good on the floor. You got to be good with the players. And you also got to be an X and O guy. And I think, if I, I think I will get two two guys and that fit that caliber and one uh, ex head coach and the part about uh, there's another part of my journey when you say get out of your comfort zone I I don't mind hiring a guy that I don't know because it's it's, it's it's forcing me to get out of my comfort zone we'll probably get more results if I don't know you now I'm forced to make a relationship with you I see your work ethic you're coming with different views I think that'll be really really good. So I'm 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 not opposed to uh, hiring somebody that I don't know, even though the textbook on coaching says always hire somebody that you know and that you trust. But I mean I've seen those fail as well. Appreciate it. We got time for one more question if we have one. Anyone has one more question for coach? Well, thank you guys. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, it's been great. Uh, I'm going to leave my number in the chat as well. Re feel free to reach out anytime. I'm not one of these. Uh, I know a lot of you guys on this chat. I'm always available. I'm not one of these uh, guys that made it to a, a big level. And, and I, I remember where I came from and I was in your shoes one day. So I'm going to leave my number in the chat. If you guys have anything, just hit me up. Appreciate you, Tone. Appreciate you coming on, and obviously, you know, I know he's uh, just like yeah, Coach Yeah, just Hall. sign one of my players. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know just like Coach Hodge, Coach Dean's going to be a head coach really soon, so uh, hopefully you guys – Who said that? Up. Who said I signed one of their players? <laughs> that was you your boy. You know who said that. You and Maddox. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, Kurt. Hey, if you, get, if, you send me, if you give me a player, I can do some more Zoom calls so I can keep a job. <laughs> uh, hey, you and Dave, y'all owe me. Dave Dickerson, I've been, I'm up here fading, saying up to listen to y'all. <laughs> anyway, go ahead, Billy. No, you good. Just introduced our next guest. So without further ado, I'll, I'll turn it over to Coach Dickerson. Uh, let, let me tell the story real quick. Coach Dickerson, I was on my first recruiting trip. I don't know if he'll remember this. He probably will. Uh, I was on my first recruiting trip at Anderson. We were down at the Big Shots event in Myrtle Beach. Division two staff. We were all spread out. We only had one book. 
in one car. And I got sent, being the younger guy on staff, I got sent to the high major gym because we're not getting any of those high major guys at Division Two. So I was there half an hour before the game, sitting by myself, and I thought I was out of place. Well, minute two before tip comes, and here the doors swing open, and here come all the coaches. And Coach Dickerson was at Ohio State at the time and was gracious enough to sit next to me and start talking to me. And obviously, that's kind of where our relationship began. So I'll always be grateful to Coach Dickerson. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to him. Good evening, guys. How you guys doing? Um, remind me the next time, don't follow two assistant coaches. Um, so, um, but I'm simple. Um, um, I'm learning every day. Uh, I've, been, uh, uh, I've been at Upstate now for 794 days. And, um, and I'm learning. I'm, I'm a sponge. And the game is changing. Recruiting is changing. Uh, the hiring process is changing. Um, so it's an ever-evolving game and business. So, um, but um, one of the things I live by is all in, do your job, and we not me. All in, do your job, and we not me. And um, I heard something in, in, in church the other day um, that don't ever – uh, trust a leader who don't have a limp. And that was from John Winbush, who a founder of the Vineyard uh, Movement Church. And, um, and meaning, you know, everybody's have to be somewhat humbled. And, uh, and I've been humbled in my career. And uh, obviously, I've uh, been coaching for 29 years. I'm from Olar, South Carolina. We have 237 people in my hometown. And um, I played at Denmark Ola High School for a great high school coach, Ernest Nimmons, and I uh, was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to the University of Maryland. And I was coached and recruited by Lefty Giselle, and I was a teammate of Lynn Bice. Uh He was a senior, I was a freshman. And, um, and went through a coaching change to Bob Wade in my last three years, and wasn't good enough to play in the NBA or go overseas. So I went right into coaching, went to Gardner Webb my first year and uh, James Madison the year after that. And then I went to Radford uh, 92 to 96. And I worked for Ron Bradley, who was the, who was the head coach there. And he was my assistant coach at Maryland for four years. And um, so I stayed within my family at James Madison, left to Giselle was the head coach there. And then um, after that, I spent six weeks at Marshall. A lot of people don't know this. Um, I was there uh, when Greg White got the head job and uh, he hired Greg Marshall and myself as his first staff. So I was in a hotel room with Greg Marshall for six weeks and that was hell with hell within itself. And um, so um, I never coached a game at Marshall. Job came open at Maryland, so I went back to my alma mater. I was assistant there for nine years, two Final Fours and a national championship. And then I went to uh, Tulane from 05 to 2010. I took that job four months uh, after, before Katrina hit. Uh, four months after Katrina hit. So um, we went through that, and just a tough job, tough situation. And um, my starting point guard there in my first couple of years is now my staff uh, with me, uh, Andrew Garcia. I think he's on the call tonight. And I was there for five years, went to Ohio State for seven, worked for the Utah Jazz as a scout for one, and uh, been at Upstate for 794 days. And, um, and so all in, do your job, and we not me, and be there and be on time. I, I don't have a lot of rules. I don't have a lot of regulations. It's all in, do your job, we not me and be there and be on time. And so, and I think if you can be there and be on time, and you can learn that as a young, young adult, and then your offense, your weak side offense is gonna be on time. Your weak side defense is gonna be on time. So all of those things are important to me because uh, as a coach, if you worried about uh, the first side and don't understand second, third side, fourth side, then you're not a good coach. And so, um, uh, be there and be on time and give your best effort. And, and that's what we talk to our guys about every day. And, and I believe in that. And so, um, so 
throughout my career, I've coached in three Final Fours. I won a national championship at, at Maryland, and um, I've recruited and coached um, 18 NBA guys. And, um, and so uh, recruiting is one of those things that, for me, I've always tried to get commitments. Recruiting battles, I don't do a good job with. So I worked my ass off the first year or two to try and get commitments and try and get guys early. And, um, and we'd had, we had some great players, some good players throughout my career. And um, so I'll go in a little different direction because I, I know the guys, the two guys went a little long. Um, I'll give you what I look for in an, an assistant coach and um, somebody who's gonna work their butt off uh, somebody that's, that's smart, that's really smart, and someone that's a team player. And obviously, uh, when you win at the highest level the way I've done, if you have a staff that's, that, are, that, that is not team-oriented, then it's not going to work. You, you, don't, you, you don't make a mistake and win at a high level. And so, um, so hard worker, very, very smart, and a team player. And I think a good assistant coach these days is going to have to be a crisis manager and be a psychiatrist. And so because, um, you know, um, I didn't know what I was, um, what parents were sending me until I sent my son to the University of South Carolina. And so I have a better feel for kids now. And kids are going through a lot. And uh, so you, you have to have a staff that's really good at crisis, uh, that, at handling crisis. And someone have a being a little bit of a psychiatrist, and then uh, I, I want a staff that's going to be really, really good uh, between five five thirty p.m. and twelve midnight, because and, and um, because you know during the day you're in the office, uh, you're, you're you're doing whatever you're going to do, but how you become a good team and a good program. You have to have guys that's going to be in the gym and be around the guys in the dorm and get to know them, build relationships, and and so um, and and so being a good assistant coach from 5:30 p.m. into 12 uh, 12 midnight is really really important to me because uh, I always tell my teams just like you tell your teams um, and you tell your players there's nothing good happen after 12 midnight right so you expect for your guys to be in so uh, you got to have somebody who's going to get them in the gym, who's going to bring them back over to the office, who's going to go over to the dorm and talk to them and have a good relationship with them because um, you just have so many people and in, in players here right now. And so you got to have someone to try and mitigate that. And then recruiting, um, you know, recruiting is important. It's the lifeblood of the program. And obviously you want to recruit, recruit players that um, – you want to coach. So you got to recruit players that you want to coach. If you don't like them, when you recruit them, then don't recruit them. You know what I mean? And so uh, that's what I've always done. When I was an assistant coach, I got to know the head coach and his tendencies. And I worked for, for, for some great guys. I mean, two of my guys I work for in the Hall of Fame right now, Gary Williams, um, uh, Lefter Giselle, and I think Thad Mata being the Hall of Fame as well. Um, so, um, so you got to do a good job recruiting. You got to recruit players that you want to coach, and you got to recruit players that the coach can coach. And so, if you recruit an asshole, and the coach can't handle asshole, then you're as, as kind of intuitive, right? So, um, re recruit players that you want to coach, and recruit recruit players that the head coach can coach. And um, so uh, um, you had to do that under Gary Williams because if he recruited a prima donna, he couldn't make it. And so, uh, and, and then the last thing I, I think is important is that it's not what you know, it's what the players know and what the players can comprehend. And so, because everybody, uh, uh, like Raul said earlier, everybody can coach, everybody knows basketball, and we understand that. Um, and everyone has big dreams of doing this and doing that. I want to play like this. I want to play like that. But if your if players can't comprehend it, you can't do that. And so uh, from that aspect of it, um, and I know it's late, so I'll open it up to questions. I mean, I'm, I've been married for 21 years. I have a son. And um, 
So um, that's kind of who I am. So um, ask questions if you have any. Dave, this is yes. Cliff Warren calling from Georgia State in well, Atlanta, Georgia. Yep. Always a pleasure to see you. I know most of these guys are uh, younger than uh, the both of us, so I know we both got to hurry up and go to bed. But really fast, can you talk about what your mentality was? What kinds of things did you do in transition from Tulane being the head coach and then being out of college basketball for a year to turning it back around being the head coach at South Carolina Upstate? Tough. It was tough. I mean, uh, I, my 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 uh, mentality has changed a lot. Um, I remember my assistant coaching days at Maryland when you were at Georgia Tech. You know, we you know we had to. It was it was, it was tough. It was just tough. And my mentality was always that I was just trying to survive day to day. Really, working for someone that's tough and demanding like Gary Williams. You know, I got I, my nine years. I got fired fifteen times. And uh, so uh, just a tough deal. And my mentality was just trying to survive and, and really um, um, when I left Tulane to go to Ohio State, it was a big adjustment because I was um, really uh, a part of the country I never coached in. And um, the Big Ten is an unbelievable conference. It's a well-coached conference. Uh, it's a well-prepared conference, and uh, you got to be ready every night. And it's a tough, tough, tough deal. And um, being out of the, the, the uh, coaching for one year for me, um, it was it was difficult. A lot of people don't know my story, but uh, my wife was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer in uh, in 2017, in uh, March of eighth, and uh, we lost our job at Ohio State June fifth. And so uh, I was humbled and, and I had to figure out how can I be a better husband? How can I be a better father? And so I elected to uh, not coach that year so I can become a better person, become a better husband, better, become a better father and, and try to help my wife stay alive. And so, uh, and so that was one of the best years of my life because I, I uh, Utah Jazz sent me a lifeline of being a regional scout. So I stayed at my home, didn't have to move to uh, uh, Salt Lake City. And, and I uh, just had a chance to just really reflect and humble myself to, to kind of uh, lose myself from me to be about my wife and be about my son, be about our family. And uh, so that, that, that was very, very humbling for me. And then, you know, getting back in college coaching, I mean, coaching changes every year. People say it's different, but it changes every year to me. I mean, I, I, I haven't seen no year the same. And uh, recruiting is crazy. Recruiting is foul. It's, uh, a lot of people uh, do things different. Uh, social media aspect of it is big. And, um, and and the the year I was out, um, I, I did not want to go back into being an assistant coach. So I prayed every day to be a head coach, and um, and so I was fortunate that spring I was interviewing for two head jobs, and I ended up getting uh, taking Upstate because it was a challenge. It was it was it was down back in my home state, and um, and I thought it would be a great challenge for me in my career. And so uh, you have to be flexible and you have to have, uh, you have to learn every day to adapt and being a crisis manager. Like I, I think that's one of the biggest things you can do at being a coach these days, and especially being an assistant coach, you got to learn how to deal with crisis because you're going to have them every day because of the kids you deal with, because you don't have their voice. You don't have their mind. So a lot of people have that. So you gotta you gotta unplug them, and replug them every day, and so uh, those are just some of the things that I think is important uh, when you go from job to job and situation to situation. Dave, if you don't mind, I'm gonna follow up with that too. And you've talked about it. The other speakers have talked about just being humble and staying humble. 
One of the things you said, I remember talking to you a while ago before you took the upstate job was, if I ever get a chance again, I'm going to make sure I enjoy it and the players enjoy it. Yep. You gave an example. Cliff, I'm going to have ice cream parties with my team. I'm going to make sure they have fun and enjoy it. And then lastly, many moons ago, I got a chance to interview for a head coaching job at Jacksonville University. The night before my last interview with them, I was talking to you on the phone and you gave me great advice. And you said, hey, Cliff, if you don't get the job, what's the worst thing that's going to happen? I was like, I don't know. I guess I'll go back to Georgia Tech. He says, and live in Atlanta and be around all them fine women. I said, yeah. He said, so when they give you a chance to talk about what you want to talk about, let them have it. Speak passionately about what you really feel comfortable with and just let it go. And, you know, I remember that to this day. I felt like the conversation was just last night and I was nervous, just like anybody else would be interviewing for a job. But you really put my mind at ease. But it just goes to your humble spirit and that you exuded that through the phone to me. And if I never said thank you, thank you. Appreciate it, Cliff. You know, um, when you end this business long enough, you, you're going to be humble. And um, so, and I'm, and I'm like, you know, don't ever trust a leader who don't have a limp. I, I have a limp. And so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to humble myself every day. Um, so, um, but, you know, interviewing for jobs is tough. It's tricky. It, you know, you, you have to, um, you have to do a great job of, of, of having a spill and my spill was all in do your job and we not me and and uh, be there and be on time and, and give your best effort and so um and um so you have to stand for something um in my programs i control recruiting i mean i i control strength strength and addition and academic support because those are the two most important things to a successful program and so those guys, my strength and conditioning coach and my academic support person answered to me and not, no, and not an assistant coach. So I just think those things are important. But, um, it, it, you know, um, but, you know, the job interviews are tough right now because, you know, I've been through two or three uh, searches here at Upstate and my AD is only looking at head coaches. <laughs> They're not looking at assistant coaches. And so the landscape is changing. It's hard to get a head job. It's hard. And so when you get a chance to take a job, whether D2, JUCO, whatever it is, uh, as a head coach, you may want to take a look at that because ADs are very reluctant these days to hire someone that haven't done it. And so I, I just think that um, a lot of high major assistant coaches uh, these days, they sit back and try and be selective with jobs. And plus, they're making a lot of money. And so they don't want to take a pay cut. But, you know, it's hard to hire a guy if you don't, if you're not, a, if you're not, if they won't hire him unless you're a head coach these days. And the jobs that you get are so bad <laughs> that we're, you know, you got to turn that thing around. So, um, um, but no, that's, that's, that's being humble every day because th 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 this game is not perfect. So any other questions? Coach. Yeah, I got, oh. Hey, uh, appreciate you sharing your story and stuff. Um, my question is the all in, do your job, we not me, uh, be there, be on time, give everything you got. How and when did you – um develop that philosophy and did you spend a lot of time thinking about it did you play with were, were there other things that you were maybe close to hanging on to I mean kind of how did you get to that because uh like we like I mentioned earlier I think that's like a big a big part you know and no matter what setting you're in you can clearly ramble that and what it means to you and it's authentic it's not when I hear you talk about it, I know it's genuine and you, you believe in it, you know? Yeah. I just think that when you guys are assistant coaches, you, you never, you gotta, 
you got to almost think like a head coach as well. And um, because with these days, anything can happen where you, you're, where you're coaching the team. And so um, my years of being an assistant coach, I, I knew that being there and being on time was a big thing because it's hard to get young kids to be on time. And um, so um, to uh, importance of the weak side offense and weak side defense, because that's the, I said, everybody can play strong side. Everybody can, and, and coach, you said you're a point guard. You had a different view, and Cliff was a point guard. You guys have a different view of the game because you had the ball and you made decisions. But uh, be there and be on time and do your best job. I mean, that's, that's give your best effort is something that I've always thought was important to handle because if you can get kids conscious of time, then that's, that's a big battle you've won. Mm. All in, do your job, and we not me. I mean, everybody's selfish. We got selfish kids. I mean, we got selfish kids, selfish, selfish parents. Selfish AU coaches, self. Everybody's selfish because everybody wants the best for their kid. They don't want the best for the team. And we're in a situation at Ohio State. We were in a uh, a home of a really, really good player. And the mom and dad said, "We're we're not concerned about your team. We're only concerned about our kid." Hmm. And Coach Maude and I got up and left. Wow. And so, and that kid was a great player. And so from an assistant coach standpoint, you, you got to make sure you recruit kids who, who you like, who you want to coach, and most importantly, who your coach want to coach. And that can thrive when you're a coach. Because I'm tough. And, and, and if you don't have a sense of toughness and you don't want to be coached, then you can't play for me. And, and so those things are important to me. But uh, th those two sayings is really – but as I go through it, you know, don't trust a leader that don't have a limp. You know, you got to humble yourself when you go into these interviews. You try and say that I know everything. And you become a little not believable. Did and, you did you have the all in, do your job, we not me? Did you have that at Tulane too? I developed that at, at Ohio State. At Ohio State because I understood that recruiting had changed in my five years from Tulane, from Maryland, to Ohio State at a change to where we had to get guys to be all in. Yeah. And have to, you know, you, you have to give your team their jobs. And, it's, and you got to get them to think about we, not me, every day. Every day. And yeah. uh, so at Ohio State, we went, to a, we went to the Final Four and we won four Big Ten championships. And uh, we have some, had some great players. But Coach Mata was a hell of a coach. And we, we had a staff, and I know you mentioned earlier, like, like, I don't know about being on bad staffs. You know, if, if, if we, we have a staff member that takes credit for success, um, it, it's too hard to win. Yeah. It, it, it's too hard to win. So, um, like, the staff I have at Upstate, I have Andrew Garcia, who's on the call. He's my point guard at Tulane. I have Ron Bradley, who's six or seven years old. He recruited me, he recruited me out of high school, coached me in college. And I worked for him for four years when he was head coach at, uh, at Radford. I have Stacy Palmore, who I've known for 20 years. And so I'm a little different because when I have an opening, I have four guys that I'm going to hire already. Mm -hmm. And so um, people are hiring people who they know now. And so the advice you gave, like, be persistent and try and get meaningful relationships, those things are important. Because like me right now, no one can change my mind on the people I'm going to hire if I have an open. It, I'm going to hire one of the four guys. And it's not a black, white thing or black, white member of the staff. No, if anybody leaves, I'm going to hire one of those four guys. And, and so, uh, so those are some of the things that I think are important. And um, yeah. Appreciate that, Coach. Yep. Anybody else? Hey, Coach Dickerson, Kareem Brown here from Niagara County. Hey, Kareem. I, um, have you, have you picked up or learned something, uh, you've been coaching for a while now or learned something new in the last six to eight weeks being home? Yes. Oh, yes. Nothing oh, and, changes. And what is, nothing what, changes. And what, what is, what is something that you can give? I've, I've learned that nothing changes if nothing changes. So 
it, it's simple, but nothing changes if nothing changes, right? So we got to change, you know, because the kids these days really are kind of reluctant to change. And I've learned that um, uh, you have to humble yourself. Um, uh, my coach, uh, Coach uh, Garcia and I had a, uh, about an hour conversation a day about offensive concepts that, that we really have to be able to do a good job of teaching our team com concepts, concepts when we get back of, because we had one of the fourth or fifth youngest teams in college basketball last year. And so we just, we were young and talented and dumb. Um, but we played hard and played the right way, and we, 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 we got some enthusiasm with the program. Now we got to take it to the next level. And so my concept for me is automatics. And so, in other words, everybody say different things, but my automatics is teaching kids how to play, right? And, and so we, we listened to a Zoom call with uh, Ryan Pannon and um, just learned offensive concepts and just trying to get some automatics within those concepts and talk about spacing because spacing is big these days. If you can't space the court, you can't play. And uh, so when I got to Tulane, I was an inside out coach. The ball had to go in the paint. We won the national championship. We were one of the first teams to win the national championship didn't have our McDonald's all American. And we threw the ball inside every third possession. If you didn't, you were coming out. Now, the game is not that anymore. And if you do that, you're probably going to lose. So you got to be able to make plays from the perimeter. You got to be able to uh, create uh, opportunities for others. And you got to be unselfish. And you got to be great at the rim. You got to be great from the free throw line. And you got to be great from the three point line. And so, all those things right now. I'm getting a chance to manifest myself so I can be better when the kids come back. So, um, so, so to answer your question specifically, with offensive concepts to me is what I'm learning right now. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, oh, Coach, right. um, this is uh, Larry Thompson, the head boys coach at Willow High School in Marietta. Uh, hey, my Coach. Question, hey, how you doing? Uh, my coach, my question is centered around recruiting. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like to know your thoughts about um, just how crazy it is with the transfer portal and what's your thoughts around recruiting. The uh, reason why I asked it is, uh, of course, I coach high school and I, and, and I want to have the best tools possible to help high school kids, you know, get better opportunities. Um, but just tell me your thoughts around, you know, just the overall climate of, of, of recruiting and the transfer portal. Well, I think first of all, and I think Cliff will be able to uh, contest, um, contend to this, is that um, we're going to have to be, do a good job. And even you coach in high school. I mean, you got transfers as well. So, I mean, every coach in the country is going to have to be able to do a good job of coaching a different team every year. And so what John Calipari is doing and what Coach K is doing Everybody got to be able to do that at a, at a certain, a certain, you know, you have to have, because you're not going to have guys for three and four years anymore. You're not going to have that. And so uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to develop myself from a, from a, um, a offensive standpoint and a defensive standpoint to kind of be that coach where I have my system. It's a, it's an easy system. You got to teach them how to play within that system and try and perfect that on a daily basis so it can get good enough to where you can win games. Because knowing next year, you probably, like I, at, our, at our level in the Big South, and the Big South has some really good coaches and some really good players. We had a kid go to Marquette. We had a kid go to uh, Louisville. Had a kid last year go to North Carolina. Guys are leaving. So your best player is probably going to leave. And so, and so I, I just think that every coach got to do a great job at knowing and, 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 and trying to somehow coach a different team every year, but still trying to have some type of philosophies that you, under, that you believe in and that you trust. But knowing that you could possibly lose, you know, better kids, you know, year in, year out, is the mindset still to coach the same way or just – 
adjust with the time because you know you'll be having a change in roster maybe, you know, year in, year out? No, I got to adjust. I mean, I, I, I have to adjust. I mean, I, um, I got to have great relationship with our players. We got to have great relationship with the guys that we recruit. And, but most importantly, you got to be honest, right? I mean, I, I just think that uh, coaches get into a lot of trouble when they're dishonest. And um, so I think you got to be really honest with your, with your approach and, um, and really get to know them uh, off the court. And, and because um, kids have a, a trusting problem because they have so many people in their lives. Everybody got their own individual workout guy. Then you got the high school coach, you got the AU coach, you got um, somebody, that, you know, it's so like, like they end up trusting so many people to work where when you get them, they don't trust you. You, you know what I mean? And, and so from a college aspect, but um, I, I, I got to change. Nothing changes if nothing changes. And I don't look at that as far as you coach. That's me. That's me. So, so every day, every week, every month, every uh, game, I, I have to somehow try and um, be better the next day at, at, at something. And, and, and so I, I don't, uh, so and that's a part of me being humble uh, because the approach we had at Maryland when I was there don't work now. <laughs> Appreciate that, Coach. Yes. Um, so, coach, I got a question. Sure. No, this also, uh, th my name's uh, Matt Knezic, a graduate assistant in Central Matt, Michigan. By the way, you've been asking some hell of a questions, man, so give me a good one now. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, this also regards to recruiting. So uh, Coach Dean talked about before how when he was with Danny Hurley, he wanted the highest level kid possible, right? And then you said something early about you wanted to get commitments as early as possible. Are you more concerned with getting the highest level player or are you more concerned about a guy that just kind of fits – what you're trying to do and you think would be a good program guy. Obviously you want good players, but um, it's more concerning to other people. You know what I mean? Um, whether they're what you, what fits you or if they just are the best player possible. Well, everybody need great players, right? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I would like to think that I'm a great coach, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. but if you ain't got good players, you're not going to be a great coach. Right? And right. Some of my best coaching jobs I've done is when, you know, we haven't won a lot of games. And um, so, um, you know, when I was at Maryland from 96 to 05, you know, in the ACC, you know, you had uh, Duke won the national championship in 01. We won it in 02 and North Carolina won it in 03. And then Georgia Tech went to the final. You know, it's like, so, so when, when you just went against great teams and great coaches every day. And so uh, I know Cliff and I approach was somewhat similar. We had to get in there and develop relationships and you had to try and do it early because like our motto at Maryland was, we're not going to beat Duke and North Carolina from a perception standpoint. Like, like Duke can come in and get my wife to go to, to Duke. <laughs> and you know, so you're not changing that. Right. So our perception was you got to beat them on the floor. So we, so we try to recruit guys that had two chips on their shoulder, you know, and, um, and, and so in order to get those guys, you had to get in there early and do a good job. And so I want great players. I want to recruit great players, but I also don't want to sacrifice the other things because um, the character piece is a lot and the loyalty piece is a lot right now. And, and so if you compromise a lot, too, too many things, you end up recruiting different, different players uh, every year, right? Yeah. So, uh, but really good question, though. All right. Anybody Appreciate else? That. Anyone else for Coach? But guys, I, I really appreciate you, David. Uh, I, I haven't told you this, and obviously uh, I met you when I met you. I was on the court when I saw you and I'm glad you came because I couldn't fall asleep then. And, um, but, uh, Hey, I, 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 I want to tell you this and, and, and I should have told you this before you, you're, you're one of my idols, man. Uh, and, and obviously I look up, you know why? Because every place I've been since I've been back in South Carolina, you've been, you know what I mean? Every place I've gone to say, you've never uh, used your situation as an excuse. 
you know, you grind it, you work, you get out there, you get to know people and, and, and you're doing this. And this is really, really good for coaches to get in front of coaches and give each other their deal. And so I, I, I really appreciate you doing this and, and you are a role model to me. Well, I appreciate that coach. It means a lot. And I know you're not looking up to me, but I know what you mean. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking up to you. So, but, uh, but no, I really appreciate that coach. It means a lot, especially coming from you and how long we've known each other. So know that, that, that I really appreciate that. So, and I appreciate you coming on and share with us. Uh, meant a lot having you on and, and want to give a shout out to coach Warren. I appreciate you coming on and adding a lot of value to the conversation as well. So thank you for that. And thank you for everyone for joining us tonight. Um, everyone, I thought it was really good. Great conversation, great questions. And, and hopefully you, uh, hopefully everybody left with something. So thank you everyone for joining and uh, we'll be back again uh, next week. So y'all have a great rest of your night. Thanks guys. Appreciate it fellas.